Nothing beats a licensed game. I mean, what better way to start your morning than by popping in a game based on your favorite franchise, expecting something just as good as your favorite series, only to be either extremely disappointed or to be like, well, that was okay. While there have been some licensed games that have done pretty well, most have been mediocre at best and at worst being buried in a desert. These games are made to target the fan base and nothing else. Now, while Western developers will make games based on Western franchises and Japanese developers will do the same for Japanese franchises, what happens when the inverse happens? What happens when a Japanese company gets the rights to develop a game based on a Western franchise? <laughs> All hell breaks loose. Throughout gaming history, many notable Japanese companies have developed games based on popular Western characters. Whether it be Capcom's stint with Disney, or even more recent examples like Transformers Devastation developed by Platinum Games, they've shown that they can be faithful to the franchise while also being accessible to newer gamers. But when a license is signed, sometimes there are restrictions as to what regions that game can be released in. And we'll be looking at some games developed by Japanese companies based on a Western franchise and released exclusively in Japan. And one of the first games we'll look at is... A game about an orange cat. A Week of Garfield was released in 1987 exclusively to Japan, based on the classic comic strip that the fans just love to mess around with. The game wants us to be aware that we're playing a Garfield game, as the name is mentioned twice on the title screen. Just then, Odie runs by and Garfield asks where he's going in the most deadpan way possible. So the game starts and... It looks absolutely miserable. What's with this vomit green wall? Why is Garfield completely orange? Why are the enemies bugs, frogs, and spiders? What in any way is this related to Garfield outside of the name and the obese cat himself? It is the most basic of basic side-scrollers, and in typical fashion of 1980s side-scrollers, you have invisible walls, arbitrary items, no brief invincibility after getting hit, and you die a bunch of times. I know people say that the video game version of E.T. is considered the worst game of all time, but at least that had something to do with the movie. How about instead, we take a look at a game from a more well-known company, like Square Enix. In 1989, they put out a game based on Mark Twain's Tom Sawyer, but it's Square's Tom Sawyer. So the game starts out peacefully as Tom and his friends find out about some treasure and... And that is one of the reasons why this game is still well known after nearly 35 years. Not because famed composer Nobuo Uematsu created the music for this game, but there is literally a blackface character named Jim that is one of your party members, something that wasn't formally addressed until 2018 by Square themselves, saying that at the time there were no standards and practices for how different cultures were to be portrayed. Outside of that though, the game fares a bit differently from the then recently released Final Fantasy 1 and 2, as the game is presented in a side-scrolling format, unlike the top-down perspective of the two games. As you talk to some of the townspeople, they'll give you hints, and you're also supposed to find Huck Finn. So we get into our first battle, and I use my fists to beat the crap out of... a frog? So unlike legendary animals in Final Fantasy, Tom Sawyer has you fighting frogs, snakes, and probably some other animals, but I died and got a game over. Overall, I think it's an interesting take on the RPG format, as I don't think I've seen other games like this be a side-scroller. If it weren't for the blatant racist characters, I'd say this game almost gets a pass. You know what franchise people in Japan really seem to love? Popeye. Yep, while America has all but completely forgotten about the sailor with the spinach addiction, Japan has seemed to have a sort of fondness for the character, and that, of course, has been in some of his Japanese-exclusive video games. The first game we'll look at is Popeye no Ego Asobi, or Popeye's English Game. In fact, this was developed by Nintendo themselves, as they already made Popeye for arcades and also the Famicom. But unlike the original game, this game is used to teach gamers simple English words. We seem to have a variety of topics we can choose from, so how about we pick sports? Essentially, the main game is you running around selecting the correct letters that correspond to the Japanese text. But sometimes it's a little weird. So here's a word. I know it means biathlon, so we select our letters and... Wait a sec, why did it not accept the letter T? Isn't this supposed to teach kids proper English? Well, maybe if I just try this... Oh, my bad. It's biaceron. <laughs> What's this? Is it gonna be marathon? Nope, it's just marathon. 
After completing 10 words, you go back to the title screen. Though, there's also a mode called Word Catcher, and it was a bit confusing until I figured out that you have to catch the following letters that match the Japanese words. Get the correct one, and you're golden, but get the wrong word, and it disappears. There actually was a huge poster with all the English words in the game's box, but all in all, this game is pretty redundant. How about Popeye and the Game Boy? If it didn't make my ears bleed, that is. So, this game starts out by being as confusing as possible. Why am I being blocked by a burger? What are these pecans? I got olive oil, so shouldn't I go on to the next level? Why is Wimpy here if he doesn't pose as an obstacle or an enemy? Why does it say Tim? Well, I was able to figure it out, and here's how you play the game. The game has you in a maze where you must rescue both olive oil and this baby. All the while, you're blocked by cheeseburgers and Bluto tries to pick a fight with you. If you fight him normally, it's just a button masher or you inevitably lose. But getting the pecan, aka spinach, you're briefly invincible and you can collect multiple cans at a time and kick Bluto's ass. Once you save both the baby and olive oil, then it's on to the next stage. Ugh. Well, how about something simpler? How about some volleyball? Popeye Beach Volleyball on the Sega Game Gear. It's basically volleyball with the Popeye skin. And not much else. But what about we take a look at a game for the Super Famicom, the Japanese Super Nintendo, and it's... This is Popeye Tale of the Teasing Witch Sea Hag, and it's probably the most in-depth Popeye game human history will ever see. After several failed attempts to thwart Popeye, the Sea Hag decides to concoct a potion that will turn all of his friends into stone and steal their hearts. The army also wants a piece of the hearts, as well as some random people and Bluto in the hopes that he can cuck Popeye. So, we're ready to start the game, but something interesting happens. So, rather than a traditional world map like Super Mario World, Popeye instead goes for a more board game experience. Spin your number, and then you move. The goal here is to collect all the hearts within the world, all the while fighting mini bosses and collecting special anchors. When you get to a level though, you get a really stiff jump and an anchor with a severely limited range. But looking past this, I think this game gets a pass. The graphics are nice, and the music is pretty good, with even the Popeye theme remixed in SNES glory. Okay, enough about sailors. How about we talk about Time Traveling Teenagers. Super Back to the Future 2, released in 1993 and exclusively in Japan. While the US had their fair share of bad Back to the Future games, is the Japanese one much better? While the visuals are pretty nice and there's a faithful remix of the Back to the Future theme, the controls are a bit wacky, almost borderline frustrating. You control Marty on a hoverboard and you speed up with one button and jump with the other. Pretty simple, but it was also kind of confusing at first. Sometimes it didn't feel like I was picking up enough speed, or I was going too fast and I ended up hurting myself. At the end of each level, you fight a boss, and the first one is Future Biff. It's a pretty decent boss once you figure out the pattern. And the second level is the exact same thing, with all the frustrations I had with the first level brought up to the max. Especially these cars. You have to be so precise in landing on top of these floating cars, but it's so hard because of the sensitive controls, so a lot of the time, I was falling, and falling, and falling. If 2015 is gonna be like this, I want no part of it. Okay, I need to calm down. How about a relaxing game featuring this creature named Moomin? He's actually a decently popular character in Japan, thanks to some anime shows that came out in the 70s and 80s. Though, this game of him on the DS came out in 2009. So Sonic made this game? Honestly, I could not put this game down. It's such a calming game with nice music, a quiet atmosphere, friendly characters, really bringing home the vibe of a small village. I had to stop after 30 minutes because I got so sucked into the game. If you're a fan of Moomin, I'd play this game if I were you. But now, it's time to do a 180 and play a horror game, specifically Count Dracula. The version I was able to run was the one released for the influential PC-98 series of computers, most notable for having titles like Police Knots and for its retro pixel art aesthetic. The game itself is actually serious and grim with a gothic art style. Rather than being based off of the Bram Stoker novel, it actually is a much looser take, as Dracula reminisces about his former lovers after noticing them dead in his castle. 
Now, one thing I noticed is that when I was capturing this on Streamlabs, the footage decided to zoom in. So some of the text was cut off. And when I went to another screen, the emulator decided to have a fit. After some adjusting, I was able to get the game at a reasonable viewing angle. And it turns out that this game is part visual novel and part point and click adventure. If you're able to move with the arrows, see with your eyes, think with your brain, talk with your mouth, even touch with your hands, but that'll be important later. We're soon introduced to our first female character, an opera singer named Francesca, who seems to be having a debate with her matron about going to a gala with her. Now this is where the touching part comes in, because it appears that Dracula has to touch the matron to distract her and... Well, hello! So not only are you distracting the matron, you're also pleasuring her and feeling her up. The matron worries about being defiled, but Dracula assures her that he will not do that. You have to touch different parts of her body multiple times before you can continue to pleasure her. It's a very interesting way to get what is essentially softcore porn past the censors. But after you get done with that, you meet up with Francesca, who seems to have a history with Dracula, and after some chatting in the ballroom, you do the same thing again. You know, for a PC game put out in the 90s, it really stands on its own. The visuals are dark, and the music is great, creating a haunting environment. Even though I couldn't fully understand the Japanese, it was still pretty engaging. And now, we take a look at a well-loved and well-known Western franchise. A franchise that is timeless and has inspired many. And that franchise is... Well, what else were you expecting? Who here remembers the film Kena the Prophecy? You know, the French-Canadian film about this, uh... Yeah, I don't think I ever heard of this. But Namco decided to release a tie-in game for the PlayStation 2 exclusively in Japan. Now, was it worth it to get its own game? You decide. So, let's get the game started. Is this just straight out of the movie? Well, it's the Japanese dub of the movie, but how can I figure out what's going on when it's a language I'm still learning and from a movie I've never seen? And this opening just drags on and on. And after nearly 15 minutes of nothing, we can finally play the game. Or can we? Yeah, I think my game had a bit of a stroke. Sure, I could buy a modded PS2 that would let me play all regions and would allow me to get a physical copy of Kena, but it may be easier just to find someone else playing the game. So, thanks to Wishing to Call, we're able to see that Kena on the PS2 is nothing more than a generic hack and slash and some really ugly graphics. Now, I know that I've missed some more Japanese exclusive games on Western properties. I mean, there's Star Wars on the Famicom, Major League, the Famicom game based on the movie of the same name, and I'm probably missing more. But for now, I think I've had my fill with this. 